So uh, about a month ago, I was uh, at a soccer training for my son Liam, and um, you know while he was doing his thing, me and some of the dads that are always at the soccer trainings were kind of hanging out, and we were just chatting, and uh, we started talking about work and the stress of work. And one of the dads was sharing. He works for a large company, um, and he was describing, you know, his experience uh, at this company, which I would imagine some of you perhaps have experienced in your companies or maybe even currently are experiencing. He described this intense and stressful culture at work where there is this expectation that every year is going to be better than the previous year. So maybe there was a year where you know, sales were really good and you did 5%, 10%, or even better than that, but then there's kind of this expectation of, well, you're just gonna keep doing that, right? You're just gonna keep exponentially growing, and despite the economy, despite market conditions, despite these things, everything's just gonna keep growing. And so he described, uh, what he's experienced at his current company, which is very similar to the previous companies that he's worked for. Extremely high expectations. Work is just a grind. It is emails late into the night that you're expected to answer with more on the weekend. And then he sp spoke specifically about an older guy at his company, uh, a man who has a vast amount of company knowledge and product knowledge, but who hasn't been quite hitting his numbers recently and how this guy pretty much knows he's going to lose his job. And so then we were discussing you know, th that kind of culture and how you know, people a lot of times now these days just move from one company to the next, just constantly moving. And in one sense, could you blame them if, if that's what the culture is like? Why would you show any loyalty to this company when they don't seem to have any loyalty to you? It's like people have become machines, just cogs in this bigger machine that has to keep growing and growing and grinding out results regardless of what it does to people and the culture of a company. Now I want you to imagine if that was where you worked and then you came into a new place of work, a, a new company, and they still care about the product and they still care about doing well but you could tell immediately that this is a different place. This is a place where people are treated like people, where people are honored and valued for the gifts that they have to share, that those with you know, long-standing knowledge of the company and the product are valued for the wisdom that they bring, not just when they hit their numbers. And you have a boss in this new job just like you have a boss in any job, but this boss actually seems to like really care about you and you have this sense of after you've worked your first week or even month why would i ever want to leave this place I mean, this is where i want to work for the rest of my life our text this morning i think would have us ask the question what do you want to do with your life whom do you want to serve what do you want to give yourself to? Be because you have to do something with your life. It, like You have to spend yourself. You have to serve. You have to give your mind, your body, your effort, your time. But who or what do you want to give it to? This passage that we just read is about an antithesis. It's about an either or. Consider what we just read and some of these repeated themes and words that we see throughout. Slave, slavery. Obey, obedience. Set free, freedom. Presenting yourself in your body. Fruit and outcomes. These things will play out in your life in one of two directions. You can give yourself to God and be a slave of God, which, which Paul himself says isn't even a perfect metaphor because in certain ways giving yourself to God is not like being a slave. Nevertheless, you can give yourself to God and that is going to involve obedience and presenting yourself and it's going to give a certain kind of freedom and it's going to result in a certain kind of fruit and a certain kind of outcome. Or you can give yourself to sin. You can be a slave of sin. And that also is going to involve obedience 
and presenting yourself. And it's going to yield a sort of freedom, freedom in quotation marks, and it's going to produce a certain kind of fruit and lead to a certain outcome. But this, this is an antithesis. It's an either or. It's not both, and it's not something else altogether. It's one or the other. Look with me at verse 15 of this passage where we read this question. What then? Are we to continue to sin because we are not under law but under grace? To which Paul responds, by no means. May it never be. Absolutely not. This question is very similar to uh, the question from last week, verse 1 of chapter 6, where Paul asks, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? So let's remember where we were last week, because this passage really builds off of last week's passage and last week's sermon. Remember what Paul has told us in Romans up to this point. The person who believes in Jesus, they exist in this realm where grace abounds, and grace is king, and grace reigns. They no longer relate to God under the covenant that was made with Moses. They're not under law. They're under grace, and they belong to Jesus. And this is amazing, and this is incredibly freeing, but does that mean that we're free from any moral obligation? Does that mean that there's nothing outside of us that can tell us what is good and right and how to live? Does, does that mean that what God tells us in His Word, in, in the Bible, isn't relevant anymore? We don't have to follow it? Let me remind you of where we were last week so we, so we can see how this passage continues Paul's argument against this whole line of reasoning. Last week, Jeff gave a few examples of how we see this kind of question that Paul asks in verse 1 and verse 15 playing out right now. So the first example that Jeff gave was a recent study of uh, where 65% of Americans who identify as evangelical Christians cohabitated or lived together before getting married if they got married at all. And you may remember that Jeff referenced uh, a discussion that was happening on Reddit. And uh, there was this question of, you know, is that a good thing? Is it not a good thing? And a post that really just captured the spirit of our age said this, determine for yourself what is right. Do not let these religious legalists think for you. You can't let other people's opinions rule you. We are not under the law. Read the book of Romans. We're not under the law, so it's not really important what some external rule says. You, you need to figure out what's right for you and do that. That's kind of the argument. The other example that Jeff gave was about regular attendance at church and being a part of a church. Something that's clearly taught in the Bible. I mean, you can't even do what the New Testament would call Christians to do and the vision it has for the Christian life if you're not connected to a local church and gathering together for worship. And yet a recent study, again, uh, of those identifying as Christians, fewer than half attended church regularly. And the main reason that they gave for this choice was that they practiced their faith in other ways. So let's come back to the question from last week. Does God really care if we follow the instructions given in the Bible? Haven't we been forgiven by God? Aren't we loved by God anyway? Do we really need to be concerned about sin? Does it really matter? Look at verse 16. Listen to how Paul responds. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves... You are slaves of the one you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. So verse 15, Paul raises this question, you know, do we need to be concerned about sin? After all, we live in this place where grace abounds. We're not under the law, we're under grace. But then the question he asks in verse 16, it's like it exposes this faulty assumption. Paul says, don't you get that you have to serve somebody, though? Don't you understand that you're going to obey someone? That you're going to give yourself to something? And there are only two options, God or sin. 
And I, I don't know, maybe, maybe somebody's thinking, wait, 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 wait. I, I serve myself. I don't do evil all the time. I, I, I serve myself. I obey myself. I do what I want. I'm free. You think you're free. And I get how you could, because if you do what you want, how could you not, in a sense, feel like you're free? But even this is tricky if we, if we just drill down to, at the experiential level a little bit, because we all want contradicting things, don't we? Let me use an example from a typical college student. You want to do well at school. Why would you go to university and spend all this money if, if, if you don't want that? But you also want to have a good time, and you want to enjoy your college years. And let's just say that you end up at the University of Delaware, where I did campus ministry for five years, so I'm kind of familiar with the culture. You're at University of Delaware, also called UD, a school that one of the years that I was there was named the number one party school in America. And all of this is important because as much as we like to think that we are just free individuals choosing whatever we want, we struggle to appreciate how much of what we want and how much of what we think and how much of how we value is shaped by the culture around us. So you go off to UD and you're going to study engineering, but immediately I'm going to tell you there's a tension because one, the engineering program is really hard, and two, pretty much everybody you know five nights out of the week are going to be partying and all day on Saturday and Sunday. So just serve your desires. Which ones? Like, do I want people to like me? Do I want friends? Sure. Do I want to be accepted? Deeply. Do I want to gel with my floor and connect? Of course. Do I want people to think I'm lame? No. Do I want to do well? Yeah. It's not so easy to just serve yourself because if we're honest, we're conflicted all the time. Which me am I serving? Sometimes I get angry and I want to take that out on other people. But when I do that, I hurt people. Sometimes I have desires, but if I listen to those desires, I would do all sorts of destructive and hurtful things. You think you're free, Paul asks? Do you not understand that you have to serve someone? You have to obey someone? You have to have some master? And that can be God or that can be sin. Is it really that simple though? I mean, isn't that, isn't that so binary? It is really that simple if God is the creator who made this world and made you. If you were truly made for God, then you can either come to find rest in Him, knowing Him, sustained by His power, listening to Him, being restored into His image, or you can turn from the goal of your existence. You can turn from the love and the glory of the one you were made to know, and like a plant that's just, you know, completely sealed off from the sun, no rays of light, you will just wither and die. Remember that sin in the Bible is not just sinful acts, like bad things you do, evil things, wrong things. It is that, but it's so much more than that. It's, it's a lifestyle. It's a way of life. It's a way of life that fails to be what a human being is meant to be. An image in relationship with God reflecting Him. It's a way of life that says, I do life on my own terms, by my own wisdom, in my own strength. And it's not only acts, and it's not only a lifestyle, but it's a power. It's a power that enslaves you and keeps you stuck and keeps you in shame, pulling you, leading you away from the God of life pulling you away from your true self, who you're really meant to be, and pulling you toward death. Sin is a ruthless master. It will ruin you. It will dehumanize you. It will take your life. Should we sin? Absolutely not. Why would you want to? Now, from here, the rest of this passage, Paul argues, roughly following two lines of reasoning, why a believer in Jesus must not give themselves 
to sin. If you look at the passage, verses 17 through 19, he says, remember what happened when you believed. And then verses 20 through 23, he says, remember where slavery was taking you. Slavery to sin was taking you. So first, 17 through 19, remember what happened when you believed. Do you remember what happened when you believed the gospel, the good news of Jesus? He's talking to Christians. He's arguing off of uh, uh, what they've experienced, and he says, remember, you were a slave to sin, verse 19. You used to present your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, but, verse 17, thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart. Someone who is a real Christian is a person who has received Jesus. They, they've obeyed the gospel and trusted in Christ. In the depths of their being, in the control center of their life, what Paul biblically write the term heart, what he calls the heart, the person has turned from sin and has received Jesus, the resurrected Lord, as their king. Now, notice uh, the somewhat awkward phrase at the end of verse 17. You who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. See, Paul says, if you're a Christian, you've already become obedient from the heart to content. You've already become obedient to the heart to teaching. It's like Paul is specifically highlighting this. If you're a Christian, you've already submitted yourself to a block of teaching, to instruction, to a reality that's outside of you. When you repent and you turn from sin to God, when you're converted, you come under this new master. That's what happened. And so now someone who has been set free from that master to serve God, you've come under this yoke, this rule of this new master. You're now a slave to Christ. You're learning the way of true life, of righteousness, of what is truly good. See, Paul says, remember what happened when you believed and now grow into that. Live in light of that. I want you to think for a minute about parents who have their first child. Some of you uh, in this room know exactly what that is like. All of a sudden, one day, you are a parent, and you have this child. And I can only speak of this, obviously, from the male side of things, but one day, I was not a parent, and then one day, I was a parent. And then there's like this crazy thing that the hospital and the doctors do where they just send you home with this new life that you're supposed to be ready to care for and know how to do all this stuff. And there can be this thing that many people experience where it's like, whoa, I'm a parent now, and I have someone that I have to care for. And you might not even feel like a whole completely different person, but you have a new role, you have a new status, and there's a whole new way of life, and there are new responsibilities, and they are good, but they are responsibilities. Once I'm a dad, I can't decide... I'm not a dad anymore. I can't just turn from those responsibilities. I can't turn from that life. If I do, that would be devastating. Something has changed, and I need to grow into that new status. And a Christian, Paul said, is someone who was a previously a slave of sin, but they've now obeyed the gospel. They've come under the lordship of Christ. You have a new master, so follow him, obey him, learn from him, grow into who you really are in him. Remember what happened when you believed, Paul says. But also, verse 20 through, 20 through 23, remember where slavery to sin was taking you. Six. 20. Look at verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. When you were slaves of sin, you were, in a sense, free. But you were free like a fish that's been freed from water. This was a freedom that was contrary to your nature. This is a freedom where you could be freed from order to live into disorder. 
When you were a slave of sin, you were free from righteousness. Verse 21, but don't you remember what that was producing in your life? What fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you're now ashamed? Being a slave to sin leads to a way of life that's not good, that's contrary to what God wants to do in your life. Think back and remember those things that you remember and, and you're ashamed of and you go, that, that wasn't good. And that was leading toward death. Now consider where God is taking you, verse 22. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. Rather than this death spiral of, of being a slave to sin, of a dehumanized life of shame and regret and brokenness and being stuck and trapped and in this place where it was leading toward death and separation from God forever, now you've been set free to belong to God, to have Him as your master. And now there is new fruit. There is growing into His image and into the image of Christ. There's this new destination of belonging to Jesus and having life in Him and experiencing the fullness of life forever. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And when I was reading it, this is the metaphor uh, or analogy that just jumped off the page to me when I was reading it this week. I don't know why I'd never seen this before. I think I could have quoted this verse to you before, but I started to think about, he's saying, so what you can do is you can work, you can spend yourself and your time and your body and your effort serving sin and giving yourself to sin and working for sin, and at the end of the day, you will get death. You, you will work for death. Or you can receive the gift of life that God offers in Jesus. Paul, you will remember, is a man who is just steeped in the Old Testament, in the story of Israel. And so when he writes about slavery, I cannot help but think that one of the narratives, or, or perhaps the narrative that's just kind of hovering in the background in his mind is the story of Israel being freed from slavery in Egypt and being led by God into the promised land where they are to dwell with God and be his people. And you rem may remember that in that story, there's a point in the narrative in the book of Numbers where something just completely insane happens. Some of the people want to go back to Egypt. They're tired of Moses. They're tired of the food, they're tired of the journey, they're tired of God, and they want to go back to slavery. And they say crazy things like, it was better for us in slavery. Or, do you remember the food? Oh, the food was so good, and it was free. They actually say that, it was free. <laughs> they say these things completely misremembering. In Egypt, you were a slave, and your life was harsh, and your masters were cruel, and they were killing your children. Is that where you want to go? You want to go back to Egypt? That's insane. But that's like trying to go back to sin. Why would you want to serve sin? Why would you want to give sin, that fire, any oxygen to breathe in your life? Why? There are only two directions that you can move. You can move toward God and receiving His grace and mercy and growing into the image of Jesus and knowing His love and experiencing life, or you can move toward sin and death. And the Christian life begins when we repent, when we turn from sin toward God who has given himself for us in Christ, that we might have life and salvation in Jesus, that we might belong to him. But the whole of the Christian life is one of this ongoing repentance of turning again and again back to God. And sometimes in the Christian life, we might be just running and leaping and moving forward, and it's beautiful. And sometimes we might just be faced in the right direction. 
but we cannot go back. Why would you want to serve sin, Paul would ask. Life as a Christian is this ongoing dynamic where again and again we turn to God seeking his grace and seeking his help and taking hold of Jesus. And this is what we are about to do when we come forward to this table. When we come forward to this table, God in the bread and wine gives us Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. And here's the thing that we must soberly remember as we're coming forward, that we cannot take hold of Jesus if, we were, if we're unwilling to let go of sin. That, that we can't move forward to Jesus if we're intentionally going to move away and run the other direction at the same time. And so this morning, as an exhortation, as something to consider, if this morning you are clinging to known sin in your life that you do not want to turn from and you have no intention of turning from, you should not come forward to this table. But if you are here this morning and you say, I want help, and sometimes I'm insane, but I want to be sane, and I want Jesus, and I want his help, and I want his mercy, and I know he's better than sin, then come forward to this table and receive God's grace to you, knowing that he is leading you, and he is helping you, and he is with you. But before we do this, before we come to the table, it's very appropriate for us to now turn to a time of prayer, where we can honestly name before God our struggles, our sins, to seek his forgiveness, to seek his help and his grace. So let me give us a few moments to do that, and then I will close us in prayer.